Every day, the genetics of East Africans spark fiery debates. Scroll through social media and you'll see it. They look mixed with Arabs. It's the slave trade. People see their facial features, coiled hair or lighter skin, and assume it's proof of recent Arab ancestry. But what if I told you that assumption isn't just wrong? It's erasing 15,000 years of hidden history. Today, we're dismantling that oversimplified myth. Using cutting-edge DNA studies, ancient texts, and evidence buried in bones older than the pyramids will prove that East Africans like Somalis, Habashas, and Oromos aren't half Arab. Their uniqueness comes from an ancient lineage that predates Islam and the Arab slave trade of East Africa. This isn't just a story about gene, it's about rewriting what you thought you knew. Welcome to DNA Uncovered, the Natufian Connection. To understand East Africa's genetic tapestry, we must journey back to the Natufian. These hunter-gatherers thrived in the Levant, modern-day Israel, Jordan, and Syria, around 15,000 years ago. They were pioneers of agriculture, builders of stone villages, and ancestors of the first Eurasian farmers. But some of their descendants did something extraordinary. They migrated back into Africa. This is how the Natufians looked for reference, as seen in reconstructions done by ancestral whispers. Armed with advanced tools and a deep knowledge of the land, these Natufian-linked groups settled in Northeast Africa, mixing with indigenous populations that would be most similar to Nalotic, and Ethiopia Amoda samples, this ancient admixture introduced Eurasian DNA into the gene pool of early Cushitic-speaking peoples and created a population called East African pastoralists. This mixture was discovered when Neolithic samples from Kenya were found and were modeled as being roughly half Natufian and carrying extreme genetic similarity to modern East African. Today, this genetic signature explains why groups like Somalis, Oromos, and Afars carry markers linked not to Arabs, but to these prehistoric Eurasians. East African pastoralist admixture is present all over East Africa, even reaching groups like Kikuyu and Tutsi, as well as being found in some South African ethnicities as well. The Natufians didn't just leave genes, they left culture. Their influence can be seen in the pastoral traditions of Cushitic peoples, their stone-building techniques, and even their languages. The Afro-Asiatic language family, which includes Cushitic and Semitic tongue, likely spread alongside this genetic exchange. These languages are highly distinct from Nilo-Saharan and Bantu languages of East Africa, but this was only the first layer of a complex story. Habashas and the Axumite Legacy Among East Africa's peoples, the Habasha, Ethiopians and Eritreans who speak Semitic languages like Amharic and Tigrinya stand out. Their genetic profile shares the ancient Natufian foundation, but with additional West Eurasian infusion of Semitic ancestry tied to the Aksum Empire. Between 2000 and 3500 years ago, it is proposed that the Sabians of South Arabia began colonizing parts of East Africa. Coincidentally, this time period, according to genetic studies, is also the time period when additional West Eurasian ancestry entered East Africa. Its rulers claimed descent from the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Sabaeans imported South Semitic languages, writing systems, as well themselves and their DNA. Genetic studies reveal that during this era, migrants from modern-day Yemen mixed with local Cushitic populations, adding a distinct Semitic layer to the Habesha genome. This blend of ancient Eurasian and later Semitic ancestry explains why Habesha people often have genetic affinities with both Levantine populations and their Cushitic neighbors. Yet their uniqueness isn't just about DNA, it's about identity. The Habesha preserved their Semitic languages, Christian faith, and Highland tradition, creating a cultural bridge between Africa and the Mediterranean. This additional inflow of West Eurasian ancestry makes modern Habeshas score between 50 and 60 percent of West Eurasian admixture. While the Habesha absorb genes from the north, South Cushitic peoples, like the Iraqiu of Tanzania and the Dahalo of Kenya, tell a different story. Here, the ancient Natufian ancestry mingled with waves of Bantu-speaking farmers expanding from West Africa around 1,500 years ago. The Bantu migration was one of the most transformative events in African history. As these communities spread east and south, they brought ironworking, agriculture, and new genetic lineages. For South Cushitic groups, intermarriage with Bantu neighbors 
introduced DNA from deeper within the African continent, decreasing their Eurasian admixture. This blend created a genetic gradient. Northern Cushitic groups like Somalis retained more Natufian-linked DNA, while southern groups became a mosaic of ancient Eurasian, indigenous African, and Bantu ancestry. Yet even today, Traces of that prehistoric back migration from the Levant linger in their genomes, a testament to the staying power of ancient admixture. Debunking the Arab myth The idea that East Africans' Eurasian traits stem from Arab admixture is persistent but flawed. While Arab traders did leave a cultural imprint on coastal regions like Zanzibar or Mogadishu, genetic studies show their demographic impact was minimal. For example, Somali DNA reveals less than 5% Arab ancestry, mostly concentrated in specific clans. In contrast, their Natufian-linked Eurasian ancestry averages close to 40%, a legacy of those ancient migrations. Similarly, Habesha populations show no significant recent Arab admixture, their Semitic ties traced to Aksum era mixing with South Arabian, not medieval traders. This distinction matters. It challenges colonial-era myths that downplayed Africa's indigenous complexity, instead framing its diversity as a product of foreign influence. East Africa's genetic uniqueness isn't a footnote to Arab or European history. It's a homegrown saga of ancient returns, adaptations, and resilience. There is also extensive historical evidence that a group like Somalis isn't a byproduct of Arab slave traders mixing with local Bantus. On the contrary, documented evidence reveals that Somali clans were actually the ones enslaving Bantu individuals, and then would trade with Arab merchants on the coastline. Conclusion The story of Cushitic and Semitic DNA is more than a scientific curiosity. It's a reminder that human history is written in layers. The Natufian legacy, Aksum's Semitic infusion, and the Bantu expansion are all chapters of the East African genetic mosaic. These groups defy simple categorization. They are neither mixed nor pure, but living proof of Africa's role as a stage for millennia of human movement. Their genomes carry the imprint of Eurasians who returned to the continent, of Africans who forged empire, and of communities who adapted without losing their roots. So when we look at East Africa today, we have to remember that this region's genetic landscape was shaped by events that happened more than 10,000 years ago, rather than oversimplifying it to events linked to medieval Arabs mere 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. If you enjoyed this video, our ultimate token of appreciation would be a like and a comment. As always, the references to studies are in the description box. Until next time.